He was Cao Cao, a beige old man holding the rank of cavalry commander. His father was Cao Song, but he was not really a Cao. Cao Song had been born to the Zhao family, but he had been brought up by the eunuch Cao Teng and had taken this family name. As a young man, Cao Cao had been fond of hunting and delighted in songs and dancing. He was resourceful and full of guile. An uncle, seeing the young fellow so unsteady, used to get angry with him and told his father of his misdeeds. His father remonstrated with him. But Cao Cao made equal to the occasion. One day, seeing his uncle coming, he fell to the ground in a pretended fit. The uncle, alarmed, ran to tell his father, who came, and there was the youth in most perfect health. But your uncle said you are in a fit. Are you better? said his father. I have never suffered from fits or any such illness. But I have lost my uncle's affection and he has deceived you, said Cao Cao. Thereafter, whatever the uncle might say of his faults, his father paid no heed, so the young man grew up licentious and uncontrolled. A man of the time named Kiao Xuan said to Cao Cao, Rebellion is at hand, and only a man of the greatest ability can succeed in restoring tranquillity. That man is yourself. And He Yang of Nanyang said of him, The dynasty of Han is about to fall. He who can restore peace is this man, and only he. Cao Cao went to inquire his future of a wise man of Runan named Shu Shao. What manner of man am I? asked Cao Cao. The seer made no reply. And again and again Cao Cao pressed the question. Then Shu Shao replied, In peace, you are an able subject. In chaos, you are a crafty hero. Cao Cao greatly rejoiced to hear this. Cao Cao graduated at twenty and earned a reputation of piety and integrity. He began his career as commanding officer in a county within the capital district. In the four gates of the city he guarded, he hung up clubs of various sorts, and he would punish any breach of the law, whatever the rank of the offender. Now an uncle of eunuch Jian Shuo was found one night in the streets with a sword and was arrested. In due course, he was beaten. Thereafter, no one dared to offend again, and Cao Cao's name became heard. Soon he became magistrate of Dun Qiu. At the outbreak of the yellow turbans, Cao Cao held the rank of general and was given command of 5,000 horse and foot to help fight Ying Chuan. He just happened to fall in with the newly defeated rebels, whom he cut to pieces. Thousands were slain, and endless banners and drums and horses were captured, together with huge sums of money. However, Zheng Bao and Zheng Liang got away, and after an interview with Huang Fu Song, Cao Cao went in pursuit of them. Meanwhile, Liu Bei and his brothers were hastening towards Ying Chuan when they heard the din of battle and saw flames rising high toward the sky. But they arrived too late for the fighting. They saw Huang Fu Song and Zhu Jun, to whom they told the intentions of Lu Ji. The rebel power is quite broken here, but they will surely make for Guangzhong to join Zhang Xiao. You can do nothing better than hasten back, said the commanders. The three brothers thus retraced their steps. Halfway along the road, they met a party of soldiers escorting a prisoner in a cage cart. When they drew near, they saw the prisoner was no other than Lu Ji, the man they were going to help. Hastily dismounting, Liu Bei asked what had happened. Lu Ji explained, I had surrounded the rebels and was on the point of smashing them when Zhang Zhao employed some of his supernatural powers and prevented my victory. The court sent down eunuch Zhou Fang to inquire into my failure, and that official demanded a bribe. I told him how hard-pressed we were and asked him where, in the circumstances, I could find a gift for him. He went away in wrath and reported that I was hiding behind my ramparts and would not give battle and that I disarmed my army. So I was superseded by Dong Zhuo and I have to go to the capital to answer the charge. The story put Zhang Fei into a rage. He was for slaying the escort and sending free Lu Ji, but Liu Bei checked him. The government will take the due course. You must not act hastily, said Liu Bei and the escort and the three brothers went two ways. It was useless to continue on that road to Guangzhong, so Guan Yu proposed to go back to Zhuo, and they retook the road. Two days later, they heard the thunder of battle behind some hills. Hastening to the top, they beheld the government soldiers suffering great loss, and they saw the countryside was full of yellow turbans. On the rebels' banners were the words Zheng Jiao, Lord of Heaven. 
written large. We will attack Zhang Zhao, said Liu Bei to his brothers, and they galloped out to join the battle. Zhang Xiao had worsted Dong Zhuo and was following up his advantage. He was in hot pursuit when the three brothers dashed into the army, threw his ranks into confusion, and drove him back fifteen miles. Then the brothers returned with the rescued general to his camp. What officers have you? asked Dong Zhuo, when he had the leisure to speak to the brothers. None, replied they, and Dong Zhuo treated them with disrespect. Liu Bei retired calmly, but Zhang Fei was furious. We have just rescued this menial in a bloody fight, and now he's rude to us, cried Zhang Fei. Nothing but his death can slake my anger. Zhang Fei stamped towards Dong Zhuo's tent, holding firmly a sharp sword. As it was in olden times, so it is today. The simple white may merit well. Officialdom holds sway. Zhang Fei, the blunt and hasty, where can you find his peer? But slaying the ungrateful would mean many deaths a year. Dong Zhuo's fate will be unrolled in later chapters. <laughs>